Welcome to top seven advanced Excel tricks you need to know. My name is Garfield. I'm gonna switch over to the spreadsheet that contains the seven topics we're gonna go over. Although I'm gonna go over some one extra topic that I think will be useful. Let's see, I don't wanna show you that. I wanna show you something else. Okay, so this is the sheet. And I also have something that I call the timeline. And this is something I cooked up on my own with EBA. Uh, if I complete a topic, I will see how long it took me to complete that topic and what display what the current time is. So this helps me to keep on track in terms of what I'm teaching. First topic we're, we're gonna cover is named ranges. So what are named ranges? Well, the way I explain named ranges is it's a way to make Excel user-friendly. If I go over here, and I want to come up with the sum of assets. I'll type in equal sum and then open parentheses and I'll select the cells. Yep, lower left click on the mic. No, don't get too excited. All right, and then I have the sum of the cells that I've just selected. I'm gonna put in the close parentheses and press enter. And I have 300,000. Usually at this point, I ask people in the class, can anyone tell me the cells that I selected in the sum function? And usually people take a while to answer because it's not that memorable. But if I double click on the cell, it's D20 colon D26. I'm gonna say that that's not really memorable for a human being, maybe for a robot. A robot has no problem remembering cell references, but for a human being, probably something that would be uh, easier to remember is a name that actually describes what these values are and that would be assets so with the cell selected that i want to name and only the cells selected that i want to name i'm going to go over to the name box and if you hover your mouse over the name box it'll say name box the first cell d20 is there i'm going to click there and i'm going to type in a s s e t s and press enter now and forever or at least until I delete that name, Did you? those cells are going to be referred to as assets. I'll type in equal, S-U-M, open parentheses. I will not have to go reach for my mouse. I could pretend that my mouse is sort of like an electric fence. If I touch it, I'll get shot. So I'm not gonna move my hand over to select those cells. I'll simply type A-S-S-E-T. Look at that, it showed. Assets is showing right up there in the uh, IntelliSense. And then I can press tab. And that is very easy to understand. Anyone who's looking at that formula does not need to be an Excel genius to know what that formula is doing. It's summing the assets. I'll press enter. Another way that you can name a range is you can select the cells and you can right click. From the right click menu, there's the find name, second from the bottom, click there. And this is like the name box. I'll nickname this LIA, short for liabilities. You can call cells whatever you want. I'm going to click OK. Then this is going to be equal to the sum of LIA. And if you want to use the ribbon, you can go over to the formulas tab. After selecting the cells you want to name, you'll click on define name. And then I'm going to call this EQU. Then I'll press enter. I just named it. This is going to be equal to the sum of EQU. So now if I want to come up with the total for liabilities and equity, that'll simply be equal to the sum of LIA comma EQU. It's practically a keyboard shortcut because you're doing everything from your keyboard and now you have the total. Great thing about this is if I go to another sheet and someone says, hey, uh, Garfield, could you give me the sum of assets? I can say, yeah, sure. So you want the sum of assets. Give me a moment. Sum of assets is equal to the sum, surprise, surprise, of assets. Press enter, and there it is. If I want to format that, I can press control shift dollar sign, and now it's in currency. Hey, do you have the sum? of uh, liabilities 
and equity? Yeah, that's no problem. The sum of liabilities and equity is going to be equal to the sum of LIA comma EQU. And then there we go. See, everything balances out. So I didn't have to go back to the prior sheet to select those cells. All I had to do is type. Now I'll show you one more thing and then we'll start to move into the actual seven topics. I wanna name these three cells January. I wanna name these three cells February. I wanna name these three cells March, April. I'm not gonna select each and type January, February. That would be too tedious. On the formulas tab, on the formulas tab, there is an option to use something called create from selection. What you'll need to do is select the headers, which will represent the names for those values below. And then you'll click create from selection. Here, with one click, you will name all six columns using the values in the top row. That's what this check mark means. You're using the value in the top row to come up with the name for the three cells underneath the top row. Now, if you want to find out keyboard shortcuts in Excel, here's a tip. You don't have to go to Google. All you have to do is do what I do right now, move my mouse and hover it above the command. Excel tells you the keyboard shortcut is control shift F3. So I didn't have to go to Google. I didn't have to search um, any kind of resources online. Right in my Excel spreadsheet, I discovered a keyboard shortcut. Now this is cool because you can use a keyboard shortcut to select the range and use create from selection. I like showing this off because the keyboard shortcuts will roll off the tongue. If I start from January and I press control shift right and then control shift down and then control shift F3, all I need to do is press enter. I just named all six columns. Here's proof. If I go over to the drop down, there are all six names. Here's January, again, only selecting the three values, February, only selecting the three values, and March. Why would this be useful? Well, I need to work with a really large report, bigger than just three rows of data. Maybe it's 100 rows of data. And I want all the values or total amount for January, February, and March. That's called the first quarter. So in order for me to calculate that, all I have to do is type equal. Oh yeah, the first quarter. I think the first quarter is the sum of January, February, March. And then just like that, I get the total of the first quarter. Hey, could you also give me the, the sum of quarter two? Yeah, that's equal to the sum of April, May, and June. Excellent. I'm um, just checking questions here. Are you able to mention when you are saying, what you're saying is different than Macs and PCs? Yes. So um, the keyboard shortcut on the Mac is gonna be Command Shift F3 instead of Control Shift F3. A lot of the keyboard shortcuts are gonna be different in that way, but this will work as well on the Mac. So now I wanna be able to come up with uh, the, the quarter, the sum of quarters one and two. Now you may think you know what's gonna happen here, but there's a twist ending. So what I'm gonna do is type equal and then sum January, and I'm not gonna enter a comma, I'll enter a colon, because if I enter a colon, the next thing I can enter, just like when I select a range, is the last column, which is June. It's gonna grab all the values between January and June, just like that, I have quarters one and two. Makes your work in Excel very simple. This will come into play as we take a look at the other topics. Now I'm gonna flip over to my timeline and I'm gonna show this thing off. This named ranges topic is done. So I'm gonna type in done. When I press enter, I have some conditional formatting and I have an error message. We'll have to fix that later. Let's see, so, okay, I know what's happening here. So uh, I'll take care of this later. 
So we're going to have to do this the old fashioned way. And what I'm going to do is just enter the current time. So I'm entering uh, the current time. Let me just choose the format here. And then we'll go to our next topic. It's awesome this is being recorded. So uh, I'll change the, there it is. We have the current time. So it took me about 10 minutes to cover that topic. We're gonna continue. So goal seek. Goal seek is a very simple function. I'm gonna take you back to school. There are situations, if the range expands, will the name still be valid? No, it will not be valid unless you insert new values inside the range. And we're going to come up with a solution to that a little later, but good question. Thanks for, for asking that. I'm going to take you back to school. And there are times where you learn stuff in school that you will never ever use in your life ever again. And for some people that's algebra. And so in algebra, if you remember algebra, there, there are situations where you need to add values together and you get a total. But what you really want to find out is the value for x. In algebra, that's called solving for x. So x plus 2 equals 7. If we take a look at this long enough, we'll figure out that x, x is equal to 5. Because the relationship between 7 and 2 is if you subtract 2 from 7, you'll get 5, and that's the missing value. We're not interested in the result, but we are interested in the value that gets us to the result. So yes, this is being recorded on video and I believe it will be made available. And we'll get back to you, to those of you who attended. This question was mentioned before and that is something that I think we did. So someone looking at this algebraic expression can simply say, oh yeah, that's equal to five. Well, here's a, Here's a situation where uh, the answer is not going to be so quick to decipher. I put in $10,000 in my IRA and I want to get to $20,000 by year 10. I'm, something's going to need to change in order for that to happen. And that is my growth rate. Currently at 5%, I'm only going to get to $16,289. So I need to figure out what does the growth rate need to be in order for me to get to $20,000 by year year 10. Now there was a class where someone actually just said what the answer was and I don't know if they actually computed that answer in their mind but uh, we're going to use goal seek for this. You'll find goal seek on the data tab and it's a little difficult to find because when you go to the appropriate group which is the forecast group you're not going to see goal seek. You will have to click on the what if analysis drop down and then it, you'll be able to see it. I'll click goal seek and then I open up this dialog box. Now this dialog box is not too difficult to figure out. All you have to do is think of a sentence, a sentence that makes sense for the result that you want. I wanna set a certain cell, which is the one selected, to a value of 20000 by changing another cell. The cell that needs to change in order for me to get to 20,000 is the growth rate. Excel will take all those variables as part of the equation and figure out what X is, which in this case is the growth rate. As soon as I click OK, Excel says, you need to have a growth rate of 7.2% in order to get to 20,000 by year 10. I'll click OK. It seems like magic, but Excel is looking at the relationship just like an equation it's looking at the relationship between 20,000 and the growth rate. This is an equation and the values are related. That's how Excel is able to figure it out. All right, so let's go down and take a look at this. There's a student would like to get a weighted average of 88 on their final exam, but they don't know what their final score needs to be in order to get there. Currently, if they're projecting that if they get an 80 on their final exam, they'll get an 84, which is not what they need. They need 88. So I'll use goal seek and I'll tell them what their final score needs to be in order for them to get to a weighted average of 88. Data tab, what if analysis, goal seek. 
the value that's currently selected needs to be 8 8. What I'm willing to change to get to that goal is the final exam score. I'll click OK. I'll break the news to the student. You need to get a 91 on your final exam in order to get a weighted average of 88. So that completes Gold Seek. Uh, let's continue. And let me just turn my macro off. Let me see, maybe now it'll work. Let's check. Okay, yeah, so now it works. So it took uh, 16.2 minutes and it's 116. Well, I'm subtracting something else. We're going from actually one o'clock. All right, that's the duration. Let's go now to if statements. Do I already have a formula there? Yes. There needs to be a formula for Gold Seek to work. If I double click on 88, the formula is the sum product of the weighting and the score. And this makes up part of that formula. That's the relationship. If statements. When I talk about if statements, I start by talking about the true false function. The true false function can make comparisons between uh, a couple of values. Let's say we're looking at comparing two cells. What can you compare? You can check to see if two cells are equal to each other, whether one is greater than or less than another, greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to, or not equal to. So I wanna use that to figure out if someone is saying something that's true or false. To make this more exciting than it is, I call it Excel's lie detector machine because Excel can tell whether or not, whether or not something is true or false. So I'll type in equal. And here the statement is the content of cell C5 is equal to 27. Well, I wanna see if that's true. So I'll go to C5 and I'll check to see if it's equal to and two seven. When I press enter, that is true. Someone disagrees. They say the content of cell C5 is equal to 29. So I'll type in equal. Let me go to C5 and see if it's equal to 29. Well, guess what? It's false. So someone might say, well, this is not really useful. I can actually look at the cell and determine that. Why would I ever spend time writing that formula? Well, it's not as useful to do it with one comparison, but if you have many comparisons, you may be comparing list one to list two. And instead of looking at every single value in those columns, you can check to see if two cells are equal to each other in the first row, they are. And then you can double click, auto fill down, and you easily spot where the values are not the same. Now you may wanna to check to see if the values are different in that one value is greater than another. So you're gonna change the comparison operator. You're gonna to check to see if M3 is greater than N3. I'll press enter, I'll go here, double click. Again, it's very easy for me to pick out where one value is greater than another. I'll just look for the true. So this brings us to the if statement. Why I spent all that time going over that is that the first part of the if statement is a logical test. You're comparing something and you wanna see if you're gonna get true or false. Based on whether or not you get true or false, different things will occur. If you get true, you'll get the second value. If you get false, you'll get the third value. So the worksheet I'm working on, is it gonna be available? I imagine that it, that it should be. I don't have a problem with make, having this be available, um, but we'll have to get back to you on that. So now I wanna to check to see if these people are working overtime. And if they are working overtime, I want to say yes. What I say about the if statement is it's like a movie where depending on what happens on the first part of the movie, you will either have a good ending or a bad ending. Again, it just depends on what happens here. So I want to see if someone worked overtime. I'll type in equal and then if. And what I'm going to say is if this value, which is D24, is greater than 40, then the answer to the question, did they work overtime, is going to be that. If it's not greater than 40, 
then the answer to did they work overtime is no. Those are the only two possibilities. Then I'll press enter and I get no. Well, of course they didn't work over 40 hours. Well, let me check everyone else because I don't want to look at every single value. I only have three employees, but if I had 3000 employees, I can easily filter for those who worked overtime and those who didn't. And then maybe I might just get them all together and send them a group email. So that's how you can use if statements to categorize values based on what you're comparing. In this case, I'm comparing whether or not their total hours are greater than 40. So we would do an exercise here where we check to see if someone attended the staff meeting. So I'm gonna type in equal, I'm gonna say if this value to the left is equal to something that looks like a tree or a Y, you wanna make sure to put that in double quotes because Excel is like a calculator. It doesn't understand words so you need to, or letters, so you need to put them in double quotes. Comma, if that's true, that that's equal to Y, then that person was this. And if that's not equal to Y, then they were this. And close parentheses, press enter. Now I don't have to look at each individual value, I'll let Excel take care of that. The great thing about this is if I go over here and change this to N, it automatically updates. If I go and change it to Y, it automatically updates. So you can keep the formula there, but then change your information and you'll instantly get new statuses depending on whether or not someone was present or not, or whether or not they worked overtime. I might do this with the hours here because maybe I take hours every week. The only thing I'll change are the hours and I'll instantly find out who worked overtime or not. So how do I copy and paste so smoothly? Uh, when, you're, when you get one value, you go to the bottom right-hand corner, look for the black plus sign and double click. If you double click on the black plus sign, automatically fills down. All right, so that is the if statement. I'm gonna go in and keep it going because we have a lot of topics to cover. So let me go to my timeline. This helps me keep track. That is done. All right, cool. So now it's working better. Uh, it took me about six minutes, we're at 123. We're gonna take a look at VLOOKUP. Uh, VLOOKUP can potentially be a complex topic. So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna explain it briefly in a nutshell. What VLOOKUP is, is VLOOKUP is very similar. Is there a limit on nesting if statements? Uh, you can nest if statements up to 64 times. So that's the limit for if statements. So if you wanted to create a very complex uh, if statement that looked at maybe 63 or 64 different possibilities, you can check to see if something's equal to this or equal to that or equal to this or equal to that or equal to that and get uh, up to 64 outcomes. So VLOOKUP. The easiest way to explain VLOOKUP is to say, it's just like calling customer service. When you call customer service, the customer service representative is not gonna say to you, hey, I'd like to look up your, your account. Could you please tell me your favorite tree? That's not gonna work. So let me just check here a question. Uh, okay, so Andrea, for your question, when you double click, you have to have a column over to the left that has values. And that's what Excel uses to determine how far to go down. So customer service is not gonna ask you what is the color of your favorite tree or what is your favorite color. What they're gonna say is what is your account number? That is the only question they need to ask in order for them to be able to look up your account. Why are they asking for your account number? Because they want to look up your account. So VLOOKUP works the same way. The lookup value is your account number. The table array is the database where the information is being kept. The column index number, the only thing you need for the column index number is the ability to count. Now, assuming that most of you are taking this advanced uh, Excel course, I assume you have no problem with that ability. So the question is going to be, 
what am I counting? You're counting columns. It says that. You're counting the amount of columns in the database you'll need to count in order to find what you're looking for. I'm looking for name. So one, two. Notice it says column index number. It doesn't say column index cell. It doesn't say column index row. And it doesn't say column index table. It says column index number. So the answer here is one, two. Range lookup, I'll, this is an easy one. Basically, range lookup is always going to be false or zero. Well, I'm exaggerating. 90% of the time, it's going to be false or zero. So just trust me on that. If you don't get the right answer, then you can try the other thing. Luckily for you, you only have two options. So let's take a look. I want to figure out the name of the person with ID B75. I'll type in equal, VL, tab. What is your account number? B75, comma. Let me take a look in the database and see if I can find that. I'm selecting the database. Now, what field am I looking for? Name. What is the column number for name? Let's see. I know how to count. I've been doing this since grade school. I think I'm pretty good at it. One, two. Okay, then I'll enter the comma, and then you'll take my advice. Just enter false. Don't even think about it. Just enter false or enter zero. If you don't get the right answer, you can try the other thing. Excel here tells you that false stands for exact match because you want an exact match with the account number. You don't want an approximate match. So I'm gonna choose false, press enter. I found Sally. Is Sally the name of the person with ID B75? The table is small enough for you to figure that out. I'll do another example here, equal. Now here's a tip, if you type the letters for the function you're looking for, they start to autocomplete. I typed in V, I'm gonna type in L. VLOOKUP is now selected. The only thing I need to do to select that entire function is press tab, not enter, tab, not enter, tab. Then I can use the left arrow key, select the, cus the customer ID, enter a comma, and then I'm gonna to go to the database I'll enter a comma. Again, this is where I need to count. What am I counting for? Department, because we're not looking for the name anymore. We're looking for department. One, two, three, four. You have to say you want an exact match and that is going to be false. Now you can write a letter to Microsoft letting them know, hey, Microsoft, you know, if I wrote the VLOOKUP function, I would have had exact match be true. For some reason, I don't know why you chose false. But in this case, you're stuck with this. This is what Microsoft decided means an exact match, false. So it's a little counterintuitive, but it works. You get sales. Will I address when using VLOOKUP is better than index match? Yes. Here's a situation where I can, um, where I'll have to use where I'll have to use uh, index match. I'm gonna do the VLOOKUP exercise again. VL, tab, there's the order ID, enter a comma. Now, when I select the table, the first column I select has to include the lookup value. I don't understand. I'm telling you that the first column you select when you select the table has to include the lookup value. I still don't understand, okay. It's called VLOOKUP for a reason. You're vertically going to look up the first column in the table you select. Oh, okay. Now I understand what you're talking about. So I can't select the table like this because VLOOKUP is going to look in the first column for B75 and it's not going to find it. So that's an important thing to consider. Now I need to select the column for name. Oh, shoot. Wait a minute. One, negative one, zero. You can't use VLOOKUP in this situation because VLOOKUP reads the information from left to right. Just like you read a book, it reads from left to right. So it doesn't read information from right to left. So I can't go backwards. In fact, name isn't even included as part of the database. 
that's when you would have to use index match. So that's one of the issues you could potentially have with the VLOOKUP and why you would use index match. Other issues, if you go in and insert a column, everything is thrown off. Hey, what was your column number? I said it was two here. Is it bringing up the second column? It absolutely is bringing up the second column because there's nothing there. And when there's nothing in a cell, that's equal to zero. And over here, it's picking up column four, one, two, three, four. That is supervisor. So another issue. So how do you use index match? Is that the other training? Yes, that probably would be another training. Uh, in our level three class, we definitely cover index match. So that's about enough time for a VLOOKUP. Let me do over one more exercise. I want to be able to look up information within this table. What I recommend is naming the table. Why? Because it'll make it easier for you when you write the formula. If I go and name the table something that's very memorable and easy to remember, like O-R-D-E-R-S, and press Enter, well, now, when I go to do my VLOOKUP, I won't have to leave the cell. I will type equal VL, I'll press tab, there's my lookup value, I am not gonna leave my keyboard. O-R-D-E-R, -E boom, comma, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, comma, zero. Close parentheses, get my answer, autofill down, and get everything there. I can do the same thing here. Let me zoom in so you can see this. Equal VL tab. There's my lookup value, comma, O R D E R S, comma. Now, sales rep, I know, is one column over from uh, customer, so that's going to be 10. Exact match. Enter just like that, and I pick up all the values. All right, cool. So let me go and see how we're doing. We're done with VLOOKUP. All right, that took. 10 minutes, exactly 10 minutes. Wow, that's amazing. Right down to the second, because this actually tracks seconds. So we're at 133, a little past the halfway point. All right, so let's now take a look at count ifs and some ifs. So there will be a recording of this. Um, I'm not sure about a manual. We will definitely get back to you. In VLOOKUP, what if there is no exact match? If there's no exact match, then you'll use the other thing that I told you not to use, which is true or one. That'll be an approximate match. Yes, it is going very fast. I'm attempting to get all the information in. And there's some expectation that you would know maybe some of the intermediate uh, topics. And uh, I'll try to be very deliberate, but again, yes, the recording would be very useful. So count ifs and some ifs. Uh, in a nutshell, what I'm gonna to try to show you here because we have a lot of topics to cover is I'm gonna show you how I can figure out two things. I'll try to keep it simple. We're only looking for two things. Here are the, I wanna find the exact match, but there isn't one. What will it return? It will return the closest value without going over. All right, so I wanna find the number of employees and I wanna find out the total, total earnings. I wanna find out the number of employees. I wanna find out the total earnings. I wanna find out the total number of employees and I wanna find out the total earnings. So how I can do that, without being a Excel genius is I'll go into the table, I'll add a filter, I'll filter for accounts. I'll select the cells. And when I look at the bottom, that's 10. That's the count for the total number of employees in the accounts department. Now I wanna find out their earnings. I'll select these cells. And when I look down at the bottom, it's 952,500. 
So now I'm going to clear and see if I can do this without filtering the table. Now, if I ask someone to do this and get the count, what, they, what would they do? The first thing they would do after adding filters is they would go to the department column. The first thing they would do is they would go to the department column. The first thing they would do is go to the department column. Then they would click the drop down, and then they would only select accounts. And then they would only select accounts. That's what I'm going to do without filtering. I'll use count ifs. So I'll go here equal count ifs. What is the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the column. That's why it says criteria range. Most people say, hey, I should just select the counts. No. If you're filtering the table, what's primary is the column. Then you'll enter a comma, and then you'll click the checkbox for accounts. And when you press enter, you get 10. Just like it, just as if I had filtered the table. Well, how do you get the sum then? Well, sum ifs, good news for you, is very similar to count ifs. In fact, two thirds of the sum ifs function is the count if you just did. You just did it. The only difference is you're selecting the column you want to sum. If you read this in a particular way, this is how you're reading it. If accounts shows up in the department column, give me a count. If accounts shows up in the department column, give me a count. Some ifs is if accounts shows up in the department column, go to this other column called earnings and find the sum. So I'm going to do that. Equal ifs, uh, some ifs. And I'm going to use the plural version because that allows me to select multiple columns. Now, first thing I need to select is the sum range. I like choosing that first because that's the first thing I want to get out of the way. What am I summing? So I'm summing earnings. So I'm going to select earnings, select the whole column. Then I'll enter a comma. Now everything is just like the count if. I want to select the criteria range, the column that I want to sum if it's equal to accounts. So that's going to be department. Then I'll enter a comma and then I'll select the counts. I'll press enter 952,000. Now people will get confused here. So you know what's going to eliminate confusing? Named ranges, the very first topic I went over. I told you that we could select this whole thing and name all these columns. So I'm going to select these four columns because I'm going to use these in my formula. And I'm going to go over and use formulas, create from selection. I'm not going to select the left column, so I need to make sure to uncheck that. But this entire column will be called region. This entire column will be called department. This entire column will be called earnings. This entire column will be called years of service. All it takes is one click. I just did it. Let me check to see if it's there. I'll click the drop down in the name box. If I choose region, there it is. Now, I'm going to auto fill this down. How do I select accounts again as criteria one? You can select it as criteria range one. Criteria is an individual value. Criteria range is a column or a row. I'll auto fill this down. And this is how I'll get answers for the total number of employees in the administration department, customer service, human resources, marketing, and sales. So that's how I would do that. Now, those of you who are eagle-eyed will realize that there's problems here. What is the problem? A very common problem in VLOOKUP. Also, uh, if you get a fault, this is probably why you got this in your last VLOOKUP exercise. I'm going to go over to marketing, and I'm going to double click. When you double click on a formula, you can take a look at the values that are selected. You should be able to quickly answer the question, what is wrong with this picture? Well, it's not marketing. That is the right value I'm selecting. Something funky is going on here with the column. I thought I selected the whole thing. This is called relative reference. If you don't lock your range, when you move four, down, four rows down for red, you're also going to move four, down, four rows down for 
uh, the values for the column, which is blue in this case. So what you need to do is you need to lock the cells. This is a level one topic. So if I lock the cells with F4 and press enter, now when I autofill down, I will not change my range for the column. Let's see. So what I'm gonna to try to do is try to convince you to not just lock your range if you're using cell references, but some of you will realize the problem here. The reason I asked you to use named ranges is because you might forget to lock the range. But if you use named ranges, named ranges are automatically locked. Why does named ranges help you with your formula? Command T to lock a range on the Mac that is right. That is, uh, it's F4 on the PC, but Command T on the Mac. So this is why I would recommend using name ranges. I'm gonna do this total earnings exercise again, and then we're gonna move on. I wanna get the total earnings. So that is going to be equal to sum ifs. Gee, I wonder what it is I wanna sum. I wonder if I could remember the name of the column that contains the salaries for these employees. Um, Let's see, I think it begins with E, A. Okay, great, so that's, the, that's what I'm summing, comma. Okay, what's the range that's gonna act as the filter for accounts? Oh yeah, that's department, comma. And then what is the field or what is the value that I wanna click the checkbox in front of? Oh, it's right here to the left, press enter. 952,000, autofill this down, no problem. So here, here are your two choices. You can write a formula like this, but you'll have to remember not to forget to press F4. And hopefully you can remember that. You'll have to remember not to forget to press F4. Or you can do this. You don't have to remember not to forget to press F4 because if you use a named range, it's automatically locked. And it's easier to write. So you'll either have difficult times ahead of you if you use this method and you don't have a good memory, whereas this is not only easier to write, but also automatically locks the range. You can see it's not moving. You'll need this when you get to this exercise. How many employees from the South region work in the marketing department? They're basically asking you to filter for South in the region column and then filter for marketing in the department column. So I'm gonna come up with that answer by typing equal count ifs. And the first column I wanna investigate is region. It should be equal to south. The next column I wanna investigate and it says criteria range. If it says range, you're gonna to have to select more than one cell. In that case, it's gonna be the department column. Then the criteria, which is an individual value, but that's what I'm looking for is going to be marketing. That's like selecting the region column, clicking the checkbox for South, selecting the department column, clicking the checkbox for marketing. When I press enter, I filter the table and I have four results. All right, so enough time on count ifs and some ifs. Uh, let's go back to my timeline. I think I spent more time on that than the lookup. Done. Yes, 11 minutes. Uh, actually, I was going to go over pivot tables. I went straight into sum ifs and count ifs. So I just got to change their places. So I'll do this and then take this, move this down here. We're going to take a look at pivot tables next. All right. Let me show you pivot tables. I like this transition. I'm going to take all this information here and I'm going to move it out of the way. If I go to the edge, I can move what I've selected just by dragging and dropping. So you'll say, Garfield, you did a really good job here. You got the sum of the employees, which is for each of the departments, which is what I wanted. And you got the total earnings for those employees. And all you had to do is write a count ifs function and a sum ifs function. I wonder if there's a simpler way that you could have come up with that answer. And I'll say, funny you should ask. 
I'm just about to cover pivot tables. I can take this information and turn it into a pivot table and get the same information quicker than I did when I wrote the count ifs and sum ifs function. If you want to create a pivot table, select the cell anywhere in your data. You don't have to have selectophobia. What is selectophobia? Selectophobia is when you feel like you have to select everything before you do something. No. For most things in Excel, you can select a single cell. That includes creating a chart, filtering a table, sorting a table, removing duplicates, uh, and creating a pivot table. So I'm going to select one cell. I'm going to go to the insert tab. Why? Because I want to insert a pivot table. I'm going to choose pivot table. Then I want to create a pivot table on this sheet right underneath because I'm going to recreate what I have here using a pivot table. I'll choose existing sheet because this is an existing sheet. I'm going to click in the location box and I'm going to place it right here underneath this table. Then I'll click OK. Now, as soon as I do that, this thing shows up. I have no idea what to do. I'll go through this very slowly, especially for some of you who feel I'm going fast. If you don't know what to do, Excel is telling you to build a report, choose fields from the pivot table field list. And you go, but I don't know what that is. Well, they drew a picture right here for you. And if you look over to the right, it says pivot table fields. And this looks like a list, like a checklist. So that must be the pivot table field list. And it looks like the picture they drew here. And it looks like if I click check boxes on that list, something is going to happen like that. And that's literally what you need to do. Now, if I want to recreate the table that I have above, the first thing I want in the first column is department. I want a list of departments in a row, like several rows of departments. So let me take department and move it into rows. Wow, look at that. I didn't even have to type anything. I didn't even have to remove duplicates. That was quick. Now, employees. I want a count of employees. Now that's going to be a value. So let me take employees and they're listed by their name. I'm going to take that and move that into values. Wow, look at that. Maybe I don't like the alignment. Well, I can always use uh, left alignment to move it to the left so it looks like that. There we go. So, wow, department goes into rows. And then to get a count of employees, I take all the names and move it into values. Now, I want the total earnings. These are also values that I want to get. Well, maybe if I take earnings and add it to values, I'll get the total value of all the earnings. Let me check. Wow, there you go. Again, I don't like the alignment. I want it to look just like this. So I can go and align it to the right. I also don't like the formatting. I want to change it to currency. I'll right click, choose number format, and then choose currency. And if I click OK, there we go. Now, if I don't like the titles because I want it to look the same, no problem. I can just write over them. Excel's not going to kick me out and say, hey, you're not allowed to change the title. I can go over here and call this number of employees. And then I can go over here and type department. I didn't have to write count ifs. I didn't have to write sum ifs. The way I change the alignment is I select the cells, go to the home tab in the alignment group, you'll find the options for left alignment, center alignment and right alignment. Now, if I don't want to see the totals, although that's nice to have, I can go to the design tab for the pivot table and choose to turn off grand totals for rows and columns. There we go. I just used the pivot table to do what it took us a little while to do with count ifs and sum ifs. So that is an example of working with pivot tables. Uh, let's go back and see how we're doing on time. I've just covered pivot tables. I'm going to type done. All right, about 10 minutes. I can't believe that it only took about six minutes to do. 
All right, well, there you go. If I use some ifs, it would take me almost twice as long to do what I did with pivot tables. All right, so now macros. I'm gonna head over to macros. Macros will save you time. If there are things that you do manually to create your reports in the spreadsheet, macros uh, will do it much quicker and much more accurately than you can ever do. Now, how do you get to macros? You can go to the view tab and then you can go all the way over to the macros group and you can click the drop down. And here you can view macros that you've recorded and you can record macros or you can choose something called relative reference. That's a particular type of recording that doesn't record your exact location, but records your position in reference to where you're starting from. Now, if you want a dedicated area to work with macros, I would right click on any tab and choose customize ribbon. Then I would go over and choose developer. Click the checkbox for developer and when you click OK, you're going to have the developer tab. Now you can access your commands right here. Now I'm going to click here in this cell. I'll show you a very simple macro. In order to record a macro, I can click the record button here. I could go to the view tab and I can also click the record button here or at the bottom of your status bar, you can always initiate a recording by clicking this button that's been there the whole time. One click, it opens up this box. Now here you might get a little tentative. Uh, you're about to record your actions. You don't wanna make any mistakes, but the recording is not gonna start right away. The first thing Excel is going to ask you to do is come up with a name for the macro. So what's the name that would be useful, meaningful for this macro? I'm gonna call this word macro because I wanna create a macro that types a word in a cell and the word is word. Your macro name can't contain spaces and it can't start with a number. I'm actually gonna break that rule. I'm gonna type one and I'm gonna say, I don't care. Throw caution to the wind. Here's the great thing about this. If you make a mistake, no harm, no foul. Excel just reminds you of the rules for naming a macro. So that's the best way to learn how to name a macro. Actually do what you're not supposed to. Now I'm gonna call this word macro. And then I can enter a keyboard shortcut to trigger the macro. I don't recommend typing the letter C here. Why? Because if you type the letter C, the next time you go to copy something, you will run the macro. You would expect Excel to say, hey, you know, you probably shouldn't use the letter C because you use that for copying. Excel's attitude is more like, go ahead, see what happens. And they'll completely let you overwrite your keyboard shortcuts. But Excel uh, allows you to use the shift key as a modifier key. So I'll choose shift W. There's less of a chance that control shift W is gonna be taken up. Now this box is pretty small. It doesn't look like the W's there, but it is. It's just like, it looks like a V because it's a real small box. I'm gonna start a macro in this workbook and I'm not gonna write a description. I'm gonna click okay. Now before I click okay, I want you to take a look at this button down here. As soon as I click okay, it turns to a stop button. And if I go to the developer tab, it says stop recording. All my actions are now being recorded. Now this is not being recorded. I wanna let you know that so that you're not nervous about clicking on the wrong tab that it's not gonna get recorded. What gets recorded is what happens in the spreadsheet. So I'm gonna type W-O-R-D and I'll press control enter. Why am I gonna press control enter? Because I wanna stay in the cell that I'm in. I'll press control enter and then I'll go over to the developer tab and stop the recording. Okay, now I wanna test the macro. Control shift W, it works. Control shift W, yay, it works. Control shift W. Another way that you can run the macro is you can click macros and there it is. And now you can click run and you can go over here and you can click macros and you click run. Good luck getting someone to do this because maybe they don't wanna add a developer tab. You wanna be able to, oh, you might not be able to see the bottom of the screen so yeah, I would look on your sheet. It looks, it's right next to the word ready. I wanna make it very easy for someone to run this macro. So what am I going to do? I'm gonna choose the insert uh, dropdown, the one that looks like a toolbox from the developer tab and click on this little button called form control, the form control button. It's the very first one. If I click on it, I see a little plus sign here. If I click and drag, I create the shape of the button. As soon as I let go, 
the first thing I'm going to be asked is what is the, what is the macro you want to associate with that button? And I'm going to click word macro. That's the macro I want to associate with that button. Then I'll click OK. Then I'll change the name because button one is too generic. I'm going to change it to word macro. Then I'll click outside of the cell. Hey, I want to run it. One click. Yay, it works. One click. There it is. And it works. All right, I'll show you one more macro because I will, we want to go beyond just typing words. Uh, here's a report that I need to format every morning. It's a CSV report that I import. And there are a couple of things I need to do to it. I need to change the first column to a uh, date column. I need to split column B so that the last five digits go over to the right side and the first three digits stay in column B. But first I need to insert a column over column C. So what I'm gonna do is record a macro that records all the steps I manually uh, perform to create this report. So I can start anywhere in the spreadsheet. I'll go to record. If you're on the developer tab, the record button is right there. It's probably easier for you to see that. And there you go. Let me just check. Okay, just reading the chat. So it seems like from what I'm saying, what's being said in the chat, uh, as per our Facebook message, I would check that. The class will not be posted. The recording of the class will not be posted. So I'm letting you know that in advance. That's the person behind the scenes. And I said I wasn't sure what the case was. So the person behind the scenes in the office is confirming that the video will not be posted. So I'm just letting you know that in advance. Now I'm gonna complete this exercise, but I will be here for a while for any questions. Um, so originally that's what was said on the Facebook posting. So I wanna format this report. I'm gonna initiate the recording and then I'm going to, yes, it repeats manual steps to save time. So I'm gonna click record. I'm gonna call this macro report macro. I'm not gonna use a keyboard shortcut. I'm gonna save it in this workbook and I'm not gonna enter a description at least now. I'll click okay. Now, anything I do is being recorded. This is what I have to do every single morning. I'm gonna click on column A. I'm gonna to go to the home tab. I'm going to go to the number group and change the format to short date. Next, I'm going to go to column C. I'm going to right click. I'm going to choose insert. There is now an empty column next to column B. So I will click on column B. I will go to the data tab and I will choose text the columns. This is why it's important to write out all your instructions for your macro, because if I didn't create that empty column, I would have no place for my information to go. I'm gonna choose fixed width because all the values here in the column B are the same size. I'll click next. Then I'm gonna place my cursor right between five and one. So I split the digits right after the third digit. Then, I'm gonna click finish because I don't need the other dialog box. This is enough for me to split the information. I'm gonna select row one. I'm gonna right click and choose insert. Then I'm gonna type my headers. The headers are listed over to the right. Date, tab, and then this is going to be customer number. Then this is gonna be product number. This is quantity, price. Category, product, region, sales rep. Then I want to select the columns and then I'm going to auto fit. Then I'm going to select cell A1 and then I'm going to go over to the developer tab and stop the recording. 
Now I want to undo everything I did because I want to see how the macro does this. I use text to columns to split column B. I'll press Control Z to undo until I get to where the first column is. And I'll click mute all. I want to get back to my original data. So I press Control Z to undo several times. Now, here's the moral of the story. I have students in my VBA class do this. It took them two minutes to format the report in the way that I just formatted the report. And then I told them, let me take two minutes and multiply that by 365. Let's pretend you needed to do this every single day of the year. I wanna calculate how much time that is. The time we came up with was 12 hours. And I say, if you had to do this every morning for two minutes, it would take you 12 hours of your life during that year to format that report. Now, let me show you how this works with a macro. Now, I'm going to go and add that fancy button. I'm going to click on the button. I'm going to draw it right here. I'm going to go to the report macro, and I'm going to click OK. I'll go over here, and I'll call this report macro. Okay, I say, while you take 12 hours during the year to do this, this is how long it takes me to format the report that I get in the morning. Less than a second. I multiply that one second by 365. The total amount of time is six minutes. Six minutes compared to 12 hours. So that's 12 hours of your life you're never getting back just for a two minute report. Imagine how many other things you do in Excel that take up time that's manual, could be formatting, could be creating pivot tables. So much time could be saved by using a macro. So that's the benefit of working with macros. Macros can do even more complex things. So if I go back to my timeline, I'm actually using a macro here to calculate the time, the current time and the difference in time. So spend a lot of time on that. Advanced charting. Uh, I don't know if Nick is here. I think that would be fine. Yes, so great point. Jay O just mentioned this. So if I go back here, here's a couple of things to watch out for. Someone says, wow, that's great. Could you undo what you just did and do it again? I'll say sure. Now what you're here, what you're not hearing is that xylophone in, in uh, Excel when you do something that you can't do. I can't undo a macro after I've run it. So that's an important point. Don't make, sh make sure that you're not running a macro on the only copy of the data you have because if you accidentally do something wrong and delete your information, you can't undo the macro. So make sure you have copies of your original information. Also, if I go to save this workbook, I'll click file and then just choose save. And then I get this. Now, some people don't read and they just click yes. If you just click yes, you know what happens? You will strip the macro from the workbook. What Microsoft is doing here is it's it's preventing you from sending a virus to someone. And you'll say, wait a minute, I didn't write a virus. All I did was format a report. Well, Microsoft doesn't know that. It's not gonna let you send this Excel spreadsheet to someone as if it was a regular spreadsheet because this spreadsheet contains a Trojan horse, the macro that you recorded. And there are macros that can do malicious things on people's report. So you have to say no if you want to keep the macro because by default Microsoft will remove the macro from the workbook and save it as a regular old Excel spreadsheet. But when you want to save a macro inside of an Excel spreadsheet, you have to choose no and then choose a different type. In this case, you'll choose macro enabled. And now you'll be able to save the workbook with that macro. I would also recommend giving it a new name because you can have two worksheets that have exactly the same name. One can be a macro workbook and one could be a regular Excel spreadsheet and then you'll be confused. So I'm gonna save this one with the name macro and I'll click save. So thank you for mentioning that, that's important. 
you do have to save it as, a, as an XLSM. If you save it as an XLSS, you can't have an XLSX file with a macro inside of it. So I have the time is now 2.06. Um, we didn't go over advanced charting, but these other topics I felt were more important. Um, any questions? I'll just sort of like leave the remaining time open for any questions regarding anything we went over. Um, but essentially for those of you who have to leave, who are here only for two o'clock, feel free to leave. I don't want you to have to feel like you need to stay here longer than you need to. Hello, Garfield. Um, Hello. I've, I've recorded this session with uh, Snagit and I was going to edit it with Camtasia and post it to uh, YouTube if that's okay. Uh, would, would that be all right with you? Well, it's, I'm sort of like the teacher. What I would say is send an email to our office. We're at careercenters.com and then um, they should be able to get back to you pretty quickly on that. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Sure. And thank you for all the thank yous. I see they're coming up here. So if you need to go, I'm going to see if I can take a look at any other questions that might be there. So someone said, is XLOOKUP better than VLOOKUP? Yes, it is. XLOOKUP takes care of that problem where you can't look up information from uh, left to right. Someone wanted me to review pivot tables. So let me just go in and take a look at the list of questions here. Do you have to set up the macro each day? No, you set it up once and then you just click on the same button each time. Can I review pivot tables again? Uh, yes, I'll do a quick review of pivot tables. So for pivot tables, this is the actual sheet we're going to use for pivot tables. I have information here, and I'd like to get a summary of all the salaries by location. I'll select one cell anywhere in the data. I'll choose insert. I'll choose pivot table. And then this time, I'm going to go to a new worksheet. If you go to a new worksheet, you have plenty of space to work with. Now, I need to think about what information would I like to see listed in rows? And I'm gonna choose location and I'll drag that into rows. The benefit of using pivot tables is that all the information for location has been deduplicated. Now, what am I looking for when it comes to location? I'm looking for salaries of everyone in the location. So I'm gonna bring that into values. I wanna see those values. And now I have a summary of all the salaries by location. Something that's much easier to do in a pivot table than writing some kind of complicated formula that's going to sum everything. I can change the number formatting to currency. And then basically when you're working with a pivot table, you'll just drag fields around to see what shows up. Maybe I want to break down by location and department. I'll move department underneath location. Hey, maybe that's how I'd like to see the information. Maybe I'll switch, switch, uh, switch positions between department and location. Oh, that's another way to look at the report. Next time you open a file from the CSV, will the button be there? You'll import the file into your spreadsheet and the button will still be there. You're not deleting the spreadsheet. You're not creating a new spreadsheet. So that button is part of the spreadsheet and you can import new information into the spreadsheet. Advanced charting. So if you're still here for that, I can cover that. Let me just take a look at the, uh, how do you add the developer tab? You're going to right click on your ribbon, any tab name. What is a tab name? Home is a tab name, insert is a tab name, formulas is a tab name, review, so you get the point. Right click on the tab name and choose customize ribbon. Here, you can choose to check or uncheck the de de developer. If you check developer 
and click OK, it, you will now have the Developer tab. If I uncheck it and click OK, I will not have it. Can you export the macro to be used in another workbook? Yes. In fact, the code for the macro, you can copy and paste it into a text file and email it to someone. And then they can copy and paste it into their Excel workbook in the right place and they'll be able to run it. How do you save the macro outside of the workbook to use in another file? Yes, just copy the text and save it in a text file and then someone can copy and paste it into their workbook. How do you split the da data for text to columns? You use uh, the data, you go to the data tab and then you choose text to columns. Advanced charting, I'll show you how that works. X look up next and You can learn more about our Excel classes by going to careercenters.com. There are more things I'd like to show you, um, but there's only so much time. You only have an hour. Uh, so let's take a look at what we talk about when it comes to charting. Here we're going to talk about combo charts. Sometimes you might like to display information in the chart but you have values that by comparison are nowhere near each other. I have revenue growth. I have revenue and I have percentage of growth. So I wanna to choose to create a combo chart. I'll choose insert and I'll head over to the charts group and I'll click on the icon for combo chart. If you don't know what it looks like, all you have to do is move your mouse over to the icons, click here, and then I'll click there, and there's my combo chart. When you first look at this, you're gonna say, wait a minute, that doesn't look like a combo chart. It looks like a bar chart, and a column chart with an orange underline. That orange underline is actually the percentage of growth. The reason it's so low is because the highest value for percentage of growth is 7%. Guess what the lowest value is for revenue growth? 67,000. That's why it's so low. So you can't really make a good comparison uh, between revenue and percentage of growth with that difference. So we're going to try to improve upon this by going to this information here, and I'm going to go over and create a, another combo chart. That's a little better. The difference between the values are not as much, but ultimately this is not going to be our solution. So what we need to do is add an additional axis. I want to add a secondary axis over to the right because then the values for price per unit can be on their own and basically managed on their own terms. So what I want to do is click on change chart type and I'm going to confirm that unit sold is a clustered column and price per unit is a line. I just need to click this checkbox here for secondary access. And when I click OK, that's a much better combo chart. Now, those of you who are on the Mac, you're going to say, hey, no fair. When I click change chart type, I don't see that. That's right. So for Mac and PC users, the other way that you can get to the secondary access is you can right click on the orange line and then choose format data series. And when you do that, there is the option for secondary access and this works both on the Mac and the PC. I'll choose that. And now the values are managed on their own terms. The values for units sold doesn't have to compete with price per unit because even though the differences between the lowest value and the highest value are great, they're not being compared to each other on the same axis. The rest of this exercise is just related to formatting. So if I click on the bar, we tell you to go to format and then click the drop down. You'll choose this color. Click the background. Shape fill is going to be white background, one darker 25%. Then the shape outline is going to be gold. And then finally, we'll add a shape effect bevel soft round. 
these are actual exercises that we conduct in our class. So if you do take our classes, you will see this exercise again, taught pretty much the same way with, few different, with a few differences. Yes, on the Mac, you will have to go to preferences. You can get to preferences on the Mac by pressing command comma. And then I believe you'll go to the view. You'll have an option to turn on uh, group titles as well as the developer. Something I didn't go over when it relates to macros, you can create a macro that can work on any workbook you open if you save it in a personal macro workbook. And that's something we go over in our macros class. So we have exactly 100 people still here. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll start to sign out so that we start to complete this at about 2.30. Um, if you have any other general basic questions regarding anything we went over, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll slowly start to prepare to sign out at uh, 2.30. Garfield, as always, you've made an excellent presentation. I got a lot out of this. Thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Um, there's a lot to cover in an hour, and I just hope I didn't talk too fast and like Speedy Gonzalez for some of you to be able to catch up. But thank you very much for saying that and your kind words.